This episode is sponsored by Edgewood Nursery, producing unusual edible plants in a regenerative permaculture system in so-called Falmouth, Maine. Check out our online storefront at edgewoodnursery.com slash shop and use the code SOULCAST at the checkout for 10% off your order. While stinging nettle plants are not available at the time we release this episode, they will be available in the spring and can be found at the direct link in the show notes. Uh, yeah. Live from Edgewood Nursery in Falmouth, Maine. This is the so-called Plant of the Month podcast with myself, Tim Holland, and... Aaron Parker of Edgewood Nursery. What's up, Aaron? Oh, not too much. It's, um, it's really winter again. It was down into single digits, and um, I have to remember to actually go outside and do something physical every day, uh, or else I get easily distracted by computer bullshit and um, all, you know... Reading seed catalogs and such. <laughs> oh man, I know, I know, I've like turned into a nerd when I really like when I actually get excited to get like a Fedco catalog in the mail, and I'm like reading all the little side banners in that. I think like those little personal touches on like that they put into their seed catalogs. Like, I think that's amazing. I think everybody should do stuff like that. Yeah, Fedco has good good catalog copy. It's it's actually entertaining to read. Um, and you should definitely check out the JL Hudson catalog, which is like the uh, um, the, the the left leaning tinge of Fedco just went off the, the cliff. Oh, really? Yeah, it's it's interesting. <laughs> cool. Well, right up my alley. Um, oh, thank God, though, man, we're finally free. Uh, All our problems are solved now because Trump has been impeached. <laughs> So we, I mean, oh, we don't even have if, to do this podcast anymore. If only it was that simple. We don't even have to do this podcast. We don't, you know, everything is just, it's just going to be easy from here on in. Ooh, yeah. Mm. That, that would be nice. It's funny. Cause I was like l- listening to this podcast about civil war around the Trump stuff. And I was thinking, no, it's more likely going to be from collapse and it won't be civil war. But then after like all the shit that Trump and has been saying this last week, I'm like, Man, I just don't know. Yeah, some of that like Jesus Jesus stuff around Trump kind of freaks me out. Um I I just can't imagine being that into anyone and the fact that so many people are that into Trump is a bit terrifying. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, luckily <sighs> luckily we're not going to live forever. <laughs> Luckily, you know, the earth is going to explode in a couple billion years and all of this will be forgotten. Yeah, we, we, we probably won't be alive to see the worst of it if if it goes south, which it, it's not looking great right now. Well, on but, a lighter note. Yeah, you got to have got to have some hope or you're just going to give up. That's right. The, uh, and you know what I have a lot of hope for? Stinging nettle. Ooh, that's that's one that uh, I think you can probably count on. Even even after the apocalypse, there's there's going to be some stinging nettle hanging out. Hell yeah. I mean, it's funny because they used to my, my parents always used to tell me like after a nuclear holocaust, like cabbage is the food that you need to eat. And like, I'm kind of wondering, like, why not broccoli? You know, why not stinging nettle after a nuclear holocaust? I don't know. Um, so, yeah, we're like th- this month we decided to do stinging nettle, uh, another plant that we both have some experience with. You obviously have a lot more than I do. Yeah, I've been growing stinging nettle for several years, and uh, every year I find myself eating more and more of it. And it's so abundant, so tasty. Um, it's, there's a lot of a lot of different dishes you can make with it. Um, and we'll definitely get it, get into a lot of that culinary stuff, but it's also just super healthy, really nutrient dense, a lot of good, good stuff going on there. Um, so in the, the first thing in the spring, when those perennial shoots start to come up, uh, I often feel like I'm really craving some like nice, fresh vegetables out of the garden. And that's one of the first ones that I'm really going to. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, 
it grows like mint, what blew me away, because I'd never grown it before, and I'd really, like, the only thing I knew about stinging nettle is once I was taking a piss off of a highway in Europe, and I, <laughs> I got all I got all messed up afterwards, and I was like, what the hell was that? And they were like, that's stinging nettle, mate. And I was like, oh, my God. And now, 10 years later, I'm... Now you're growing I'm, it on purpose. I'm eating it. But it grow, I like it because it grows like mint. It's like one of these plants that I just threw in a couple different spots in my yard, didn't water or anything. And then when I came back at the end of the summer, you know, it was doing really well in all three places that I planted it and uh, was able to eat a bunch of it. And that was like, you know, that was really exciting. That was cool. Nice. Yeah. So botanically, I would describe the way the stinging nettle grows as an herbaceous rhizome spreader. Um, so rhizomes, a lot of people think of as roots. They're really underground stems. And one of the ways that that's kind of interestingly relevant for growing stinging nettle is um, it actually layers really well, uh, which is something that you can often do with woody plants. But you can actually just bend over a stinging nettle stem onto the ground or into a pot. And wherever that stem touches the ground, it, um, it'll root in there. Um, so if you're just getting your patch started from, you know, a division or a seedling or whatever, you can kind of direct where you want the plant to move into and how you want it to fill in by just bending stems. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Kind of like the way, like whatever your mustard green, my mustard green falls over on its side and then it's like, it looks like I have 20 plants there or something. Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and I like the first I'd really heard people talking about singing nettle as like, a um, like a medicinal and edible plant was one of the, like my t instructors in Denver, this woman, Stephanie, who was on my podcast. And she, she was just talking about like, as a, as like, it was her favorite vegetable to cook with, it, like replaced spinach to make dal, you know, but also like as a medicinal plant, it's like, a, is it a nervine? Is that? Yeah. Uh, nervine also people call it nutritive just cause it's got a lot of, um, a lot of nutrition in it. Um, I don't know that much about the medicinal use of nettles. Um, it, it's so high in iron that a lot of um, people recommend it for women because of the iron they lose in menstruation. Um, and often you've, people recommend making like a, a nettle vinegar. Um, so you can infuse it in vinegar and that will pull a lot of the, the mineral nutrition out. And it's like kind of a convenient way to have nettles around through through the season when when it's not really available as a, a vegetable anymore uh, but it also dries really nicely we'll talk some more about that maybe yeah that's all yeah the I mean, well speaking of it drying it's like we we just i'd never had the dried nettle before but um we were talking about oh let's, let's make some food with nettle before we did this and so we made these uh chickpea nettle omelets and uh yeah i thought it i mean you couldn't i, I couldn't really taste the nettle so much because i put so much sulfur salt and curry and shit in there but um it was awesome to just take a, a dried leaf and mix it in with a dry flour and make a, a high nutrient breakfast snack or whatever yeah that's it's a great way to kind of preserve some some of that vegetable nutrition from the garden um in a simple low energy way to uh use during the during the winter months when there's not so much vegetables available. Um, it's really easy to like throw a handful of dried nettles into a soup. Uh, those garbanzo bean pancake things were really tasty. I've never had those before. I'll definitely, definitely be making those again. Well, you know, you're welcome, man. You're welcome. Um, no, so, but yeah, it was like one of these things that, uh, I don't know. I, it's not, I don't make them a lot, but every once in a while it's like, Oh, it's nice to have a, omelet or whatever um what else about stinging nettle like i thought the dried i was thinking that like as the dried nettle i mean you could use that just as a spice that you put in anything you could put it on popcorn you could put it on you know you put it in tea soups um and it dries like mint right? yeah it, yeah so super like easy just... to dry um the way the way that i harvest nettle kind of through the season is when it first comes up, I'll harvest the whole shoot um, and eat the leaves and the tender stems. Um, it does sting. Um, some people are just really careful when they're harvesting to avoid getting many stings and don't sweat a few. 
Um, I don't particularly like being stung, uh, so I just wear gloves when I'm harvesting it. And then as soon as it's dried or cooked, um, the sting is denatured, um, and so it's no, no, not a problem anymore. Um, I usually just steam the nettles for like a minute, um, just until they kind of uh, go limp, and then they're ready to eat, and I, I think they're delicious that way. Um, and they'll keep growing and growing and growing. And sometime around like kind of end of June, um, the nettles are usually like waist high. And that's when I usually harvest them for drying. So I'll take the whole, you know, two foot high plant and hang them in bundles to dry. And then once they're crispy dry, I'll just strip off the, uh, the leaves. And that's just the, the easiest way that I've found to, um, to process them for drying. The thing that um, the thing that I like about stinging nettle is that it's like it's not or as I was looking at all these like nutrient charts earlier that I was showing you, it's like um, people talk about nutrient dense kale is. And so I was like trying to compare kale with stinging nettle and like, you know, there are some things that kale exceeds at, I think, like vitamin C or something, but like protein, vitamin D. Um, I don't remember what the other one vitamin was it? Really I think vitamin A uh, nettle was really high in. I think iron also really high. And yeah, and the thing with iron also, it's like for, for women's stuff, I was, I mean, that's the thing that I hate about medicinal herbs is like, you'll get so much conflicting information. And then like, like, I don't understand why doctors don't just study this shit and like put out like definitive shit on it because it's like, these things are really effective and it shouldn't be that hard to prove. Right. I mean, like, I don't understand why if you go to WebMD, you just can't get like clear information. For instance, like, <clears throat> like some web pages say it's not, it's, it's good for pregnancy. Some people say it's bad. Some people say it's like, you know, but it's like good for milk production is what they were saying is like, if you're lactating is good for milk. They would say that the vitamin D like people, Another thing that I think is cool about stinging nettle is if you think about the way like, you know, we co-evolve with plants or whatever. One of the things I was reading is about how like the vitamin D in stinging nettle, when you eat it like in the early spring, it like, you know, helps your body uh, recover from like the, the cold and get like, like wakes your blood up or something. It's like helps your blood circulation. That's interesting. I've never heard that one. Vitamin D? I don't really think... Or of maybe it was iron. I'm sorry. Okay. I always get those two confused because okay. I don't it's think like, about wow, those I two. don't think they're being plant sources of vitamin D. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm like, glad we have an adult in the room. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's like an animal products and mushrooms thing. Oh, man. So, um, but yeah, I mean, like, you're, you're, you know, the singing nettle bushes you have are like, what, like, you know, 20 square feet or something. It's like you can just walk over with a chainsaw and just cut down like 100 pounds of stinging nettle. Yeah, pretty much. And it, the weird thing is here, it actually took me a little bit of effort to get them to establish. Um, I got my original plants from my neighbor who had like a garden bed full of nettles that she had planted. Um, and I, you know, took a chunk where they were kind of escaping the, the bed and I planted it and it just didn't do anything. It stayed alive, but, um, didn't really produce. Um, and it was just that the soil here was so dry and so weak that they were really just struggling. Um, so eventually how I got that really nice patch of nettles, um, was by making a hugel culture bed. Huh. Um, so I had some rotten wood lying around and I, kind of pulled that into a rough pile and put a bunch of compost on it, planted some nettles on there. And those really took off um, both the like extra nutrition from compost and the extra water holding capacity from the buried wood um, really, really did the trick. Um, another thing about stinging nettle is the taste. I mean, it's funny cause my nettle, they're all in Hugo. One of them is in Hugo culture and that one's doing really well. The other one's in like a swampy area. Um, the taste, like the taste of stinging nettle is really good. And that's like, I think one of the most important things to point out is that, um, it's just a really, it's good and it grows like crazy. And unlike some of the greens, like dandelions, which have like a strong flavor that like not everyone will like, you could give stinging nettle. There's no one you give, you give stinging nettle to and they'll be like, this, this is gross, you know, unless they're like 
they unless they just hate vegetables, right? Yeah, because it's just like which is a thing. Yeah, but so it's <laughs> like you know, like for you know. It's like imagining, you know, because of like the new has like so much of certain nutrients that aren't in those other greens that we were talking about, like kale or spinach or something, you know, like, you know, like you were saying, like you mix these things together and you're, you've got a real complete multivitamin medley going on. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, what else, what else about stinging nettle? What, um... What else about... Well, we, we could talk about the sting for a minute. And the sting of seeing nettle is really um, interesting, especially if you look at it really, really closely or with a magnifying glass. Um, you can see that it's basically like a tiny hypodermic needle filled with acid. Um, and that, that needle is actually made of silica. So it's like a little glass needle um, that when you brush against it, um, sticks into your skin and breaks off. Um which can be pretty unpleasant. Um, I don't find it particularly bad, and I don't get a strong reaction to it, but some people do. Um, so, you know, once you get your first nettle sting, you'll be aware of whether it's something you need to be really careful of to avoid um, or whether it's something that, you know, is kind of inconsequential. Um, but the sting itself can also have medicinal value, um, mostly for treating things like arthritis, um, kind of in the same way that some people use bee stings um, to treat arthritis, you can sting yourself with nettles in the same way, and it kind of causes some inflammation. It's uncomfortable at first, but as the pain and inflammation of the nettle sting passes, um, it also, um, for whatever reason, I don't really understand its method of action, but it, it reduces inflammation and pain caused by arthritis and tendonitis. Yeah, that that's crazy. I, I mean, the I don't know that much about it, but it's, I think what I was reading was just like that it helps circulate the. Yeah, I I, I could believe that. Um, I I have done it just um, for like sort of repetitive motion injuries. Um, you know, I I had like you know pain in my wrists uh, from pruning or something like that. Um, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna try this earthification thing, which is what's called when you sting yourself with nettles. And it hurt for like maybe a minute, and then it was like kind of inflamed for a while, like less than an hour, and then it felt totally better. Um, so it was definitely huh. definitely worthwhile rather than kind of you know suffering for days with a, an injury that's like kind of just lingering. What kind of injury was it? Um, it was like pain in my wrist from uh, pruning, like pulling hand pruners for several hours is bad. It's just like, it's a bad thing to do. Uh, if you have a lot of printing to do, it's best to like kind of break it up with doing something else. But for whatever reason, I didn't, I just had to get it done. You just had to get it done. And pay for it at the end of the day. Another thing that I thought was cool about stinging nettle is how it's like, it feels like, um, like next, I mean, I would say sorrel. I'm sure there's other plants that are like this, but this plant feels like a universal plant. It's, it's in India, it's in Europe, it's in the Americas. It's, I'm sure, it's in Asia as well. Yeah, it's all all over the world. Um, often, often despised um, because it it is pretty aggressive. It'll grow everywhere. Um, really common in ditches and stuff. But I think everywhere that it grows, there are people that appreciate it. Um, and use it for all its numerous benefits. Yeah, that was the other thing that I was like, as I was like reading all this like old like European shit, and they were just talking about how it was like a class thing where poor people, <clears throat> you know, they would live in like the shitty, wet, muddy places and <laughs> the fens, <laughs> and they'd have to like you know, and they could just go go into ditches and make medicine and food out of stinging nettle, and uh, so I like that. Like it's like a you know, working persons, uh, or not even working, just a, like a it's poor deco people. It's, deco it's a, you know, it's a decolonizing vegetable. So. Yeah. And often those, those foods that have been relegated to like the poorest people are often the most nutritious. Um, and at least in the case of, um, like French peasant food are often those, those cuisines get like elevated to super, high class and desirable foods uh, eventually 
It's well. It's, it's another thing I was because um, I've been like messing around with cheeses and stuff, and I was uh, thinking like, oh, it'd be cool to garnish cheese with um, stinging nettle just to give it that extra nutrient stuff. Yeah. But then when I started looking at it, looking up stuff, I realized that uh, in in France they make um, rené or r e n n e t rennet rennet with stinging yeah. nettle. Yeah, vegetable rennet is made out of nettle often. Yeah, that's cool. Like, so my homie down the street is a cheese maker, and so we're both, uh, Anthony, who came and bought some plants from Oh, me. yeah, yeah. So, small world. Um, and yeah, so I was like, we were talking about that, and he was getting all excited, and he's like, oh, man, that's fucking crazy. He's like, I thought you could only do that with thistle. And I'm like, I didn't know you could do that with thistle, but I don't even know what rennet is, so that's cool. <laughs> yeah. So, rennet is uh, something that has enzymes in it um, that makes milk curdle. And traditionally, um, I think more animal rennets were used, which is like the lining of a calf's stomach. Um, and that's, I think, a bit harder to get these days. So um, more vegetable rennets are becoming more and more common. Wait, did you say a cat's stomach? Calf. Okay, I was going to say. I thought <laughs> I, I wanted to make sure I heard that right. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be kind of amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, another th- like and, and another thing that just blew my mind about this plant is its use for cloth and net and dye. Like World War Two, um, you know, all the German camouflage was made with stinging nettle. Really, I did not know that. And uh, and like I feel like at the beginning of World War One or something like. You know, the British Army placed a, uh, um, an, an order for like you know a hundred tons of stinging nettle to to make uniforms. Fascinating. And, and, yeah, so I didn't realize that the the fiber of nettle was used into the industrial age. Like I've I've heard you can make you know cordage out of nettle stems. They're super fibrous. That's not surprising. But I haven't actually done it myself. Um, so that's cool. Yeah, I think you were saying something earlier about it being like as good as linen um as a as a fiber plant. I, I yeah, wonder what saying, it would take to do that on like a homestead scale. I don't know if what I'm sure we'll find out at some <laughs> point. Just uh just wait for the <laughs> you know the Yeah. You mentioned uh World War Two, another interesting piece of plant fiber lore uh is I I think World War Two was milkweed fluff was used in, I think it might have been like um, cold weather jackets or uh, life jackets or something like that. But they had like programs where they had like uh, American school children out in the like ditches and roadsides collecting milkweed fluff really? for the war effort. Yeah. I mean, if it, I wish it wasn't for war, but it's, I mean, it's yeah, still it's, kind it's of a fucked cool up. Thing. But it's cool that yeah, yeah. milkweed fluff is kind of equivalent to goose down in its um wow its insulation um properties that's 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 I amazing mean, it's hard to wash which can be an issue but um yeah it's a neat it's a neat uh fiber material cat i i, I love bringing up this fact that like cattails also almost uh won the second world war like they were about to like if the world if World War Two had kept going on, they would have had to like ra- they they had plans of like ramping up cattail production Whoa. to make uh, starches for the troops and shit. Interesting. Yeah, I think cattails produce more starch per acre than anything else. Uh, cattails are a pretty amazing plant. We should probably do an episode on those. Yeah, I, I, mean, I yeah I, I still haven't eaten them though, so we'll have to wait until after spring. Yeah, the uh, the cattail shoots I think are probably my favorite part well, they're well, just you, like super crunchy and tasty well they're I, mild for sure but i'm gonna have to nice clear flavor. out that swamp of a bunch of those cattails so yeah we'll have a whole bunch of cattails to yeah, eat for you that got episode. plenty of uh cattail and they'll they'll just keep coming because lord knows my wife won't eat them with me so <laughs> um i've tried i've tried i've tried and she just won't do it so you know um what you know, I don't know if you know a lot about like the indigenous usage of. Do you, what do you know about the indigenous use of stinging nettle? I don't know that much. I know that it was a staple um, for some tribes in some areas, but I don't know. Don't know much in the way of specifics. Um, there, there's some interesting stuff about um, how um, nettle is kind of 
um, native growing across most of the northern hemisphere. Um, but most of the nettle that we see in North America growing wild is of European origin. Oh, really? Yeah. So shocking. Um, the the North American subspecies is just like not quite as aggressive. So when uh, the European colonists brought nettle seeds either on purpose or by accident with them from Europe, those European um, genetics kind of followed colonization. So I'm not decolonizing my diet when I eat stinging nettles. Hard to say. I mean, it's... It's a settler snack. In, I'm, I don't know. I, it's one of those ones where it's like really complicated. There's no good answer. Kind of like um, Jerusalem artichokes or sunchokes. Um, there's a lot of debate as to whether they're actually native here in Maine. Um, or if they just were brought here by indigenous people pre-colonization, and it kind of doesn't matter, right? Um, it's you know kind of semantics at that point. Like nettles were here before white people, and they'll probably be here after we're gone. Um, after the white genocide is completed, <laughs> or just all the people die because we fuck up the environment so much. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so that's how we got to recycle, man. There's some, some interesting more. botany there uh, to be explored by someone. Um, I think, like, I, I, I was looking at this website. Um, it's like the, the cascades.org. NC, ncascades.org had a bunch of stuff about stinging nettles in the Pacific Northwest. And um, the thing I thought that was interesting, well, warriors and hunters using the stinging nettle to keep themselves alert during battle. I was also reading that Roman troops used stinging nettle to keep themselves awake. Um, but one of the things I liked was like that they, in Cree folk, in Cree, Cree folklore, they uh, associate the nettle with the coyote and the nettle folk tales remind the listeners of man's foolish decision to label the plant as a weed. Yeah, Masan, stinging nettle, was once golden with shimmering leaves and a bright aura. The human beings did not pay their respect to this plant medicine, taking it for granted, passing by it without offering tobacco. In time, it was turned color to blend in with the other plants and grew stinging hairs to catch the human beings by surprise and sting them. That made us pay respect. And, uh... Yeah, I just, I just love the poetry and, like, those kinds of myths. And, um, yeah, I just I thought that was cool. And another thing I thought that was interesting from this blog was talking about how they would use stinging nettle in um, ceremonial uses, and they would burn it in sweat lodges to uh, for uh, pneumonia. And, um, interesting. All, yeah. So I think... I think that's cool and also like if you, i have a lot of allergies and so people talk about using nettles for yeah. allergy, as an allergen and hay fever i don't know have you used it do you know anybody who's used it for that stuff yeah i actually have uh i have heard of that um my stepmom had some success treating allergies with just like strong nettle tea um and i, I think to use it medicinally in that way it's usually a tea and you make like a quart of strong tea and like really let it steep and get all the all the goodness out of it and then you like drink that throughout the day um and which is like cold nettle tea is actually pretty it's pretty nice especially in the summer um yeah yeah yeah, yeah it's uh it's tough man it's tough to always have to blow your nose and you know um Hmm. Is there okay? Well, what um, what else is there? I mean, is there anything else we're missing? I mean, is there? I mean, I'm sure there's a ton of stuff that we're missing. Um, you know, I mean, there's like we could, I could just read off a thousand things about, you know, medicinal uses, but it seems like we've covered yeah, most of them. Like they the, say, it's good for the liver, right? Is that yeah, what they say? I mean, there's tons of plants that are supposed to be good for your liver. <laughs> It's like, and I can never tell if my liver is working. Or I, I assume since I'm not dying um, imminently that my liver is functioning <laughs> pretty good. Um, so I, I certainly wouldn't, you know, mind having more good good things for my liver. But um, one of one of the food uh, harvests that you can uh, get from nettles is the seeds. 
And the seeds are really quite small, but they're supposed to be like, like the rest of the plant, super nutritious. Um, and something that, um, you know, it's, it's well after most of the other parts, um, of the plant that you would harvest. Um, so it kind of just extends the season of nettle harvest, huh. uh, which also reminds me of something that you I wanted put to mention. A, you could put it on in salad, just sprinkle it yeah, in like a nut. Yeah, totally. Um, is one of the sort of ecological niches that nettle fills is it's the, um, the primary host plant for red admiral butterflies, um, which are quite common all across the Northern Hemisphere, um, all over the place in Europe and North America and really common around here. Um, but once we planted nettles, I started noticing so many more uh, of these butterflies, which was really cool, um, and started noticing that um, their their caterpillars like crawling around and they they get huge like let's say like almost three inches long giant black spiky caterpillars oh cool um and it's you know just one more uh thing that kind of fits into the ecosystem and those big caterpillars are great food for birds um and they're all kind of you know the more diversity you have and the more insect population you have and all that stuff it all just feeds into having that much more of a healthy ecosystem which is just good for everybody um the only, yeah another thing i like about stinging nettle is i don't it doesn't seem like it really has many pests but it does have like these little weird black beetles that like to like yeah but it's like they don't damage the leaves like are i don't they, know what those are um, they just hang out yeah i'm just chilling they're doing something but i don't know what it is um, but yeah, there's, that's, it's always a good sign for a, a plant being sort of ecologically useful is that there are insects on it. Um, and it's feeding, feeding insects as well as humans and all that. Um, the, the red admiral butterflies actually, when, when their population cycles are high, they'll completely, um, defoliate the nettles. They'll eat them down to nothing. Um, but because it happens at a, it happens late enough in the season. It's not a, a problem for me. Um, like I've already harvested plenty of material from those nettles that um, if they um, are going to eat all that, it doesn't really bother me. And it doesn't really seem to bother the nettles. They'll, um, they'll sprout back up once the caterpillars are done eating and keep on pumping out the greens. Yeah. I love, I love plants that can do that and just keep, keep going yeah that's what i mean it's like mint i mean it's like a weed it's awesome it's great and it dries the same way um yeah yeah it, it can it always breaks my heart when i see a chicken running around my yard with a big ass monarch caterpillar or something <laughs> that's mon- do they eat the monarch caterpillars i mean i think they're monarchs they're these big green things or it's the one it's the knock it's like the bee B movie uh, monarch, what like the oh yeah, viceroy, I, whatever or, it is. So there's it's there's like green and with the yellow and black spots, and they look like monarchs. So the the caterpillars that look like monarchs, I think, are um, black swallowtail butterflies. Yeah, that's what and then there's a adult phase uh, butterfly that also looks like an adult monarch called a viceroy. Because black swallowtails grow or they feed on apiaceae, so you find them in like carrots. And dill and uh, lovage stuff like that. Anyway, I don't know caterpillars. Wow. Okay. Well, it's good to be. I mean, it's good to know. I'm just learning about bugs. Like we didn't have bugs in Denver. All I had was like black widows and <laughs> and ants. Like we didn't really have bugs, man. I come out here and I feel like I'm in the Amazon. You know, it's crazy. Yeah, bugs are fascinating to no end. Um, I really got into the. Um, iNaturalist phone app this year uh, because insects are pretty hard to identify, um, at least for people who don't know what they're doing like me. Uh, but having this phone app where I can just snap a couple pictures <coughs> of an insect and at least get like the family huh. pretty pretty much automatically it was pretty cool. Because, yeah, I use that app for to identify plants. Yeah. But it misidentified so many plants oh, for me that I was just like, I mean, it would say, this is a plum tree. It's like, that is not a fucking plum tree. Yeah. Like, and, uh, for, for it to work on plants, you kind of need flowers. Like, if you can see flowers in the picture, uh, it works a lot better. But, yeah, there's there's no... 
AI good enough to really do plant identification at this point. Uh, which is one nice thing about iNaturalist is not only does it have like the the AI that says eh, you're probably looking at such and such, uh, but then it also has like a social media community aspect where actual people who know what they're talking about hopefully um, will confirm or tell you you're wrong uh, with your identification. That's yeah yeah I've 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 seen that thing in there I've just never I don't know I just didn't look at that I didn't look that deeply into it. Um, well, um, yeah, I don't, um, we got, oh, you can, it's, uh, duh, it's easy to start from seed. Yep. Um, it's easy to propagate. Yeah. Super easy to propagate. Um, if, if you know anybody around who has some, um, they are probably some rhizomes starting to sneak out into a place where, uh, where they maybe shouldn't be growing and, um, your friends will likely be able to give you. Uh, divisions. You can also buy them from me anytime the uh, the ground isn't frozen solid. Um, and there are there are some different varieties of nettle that I'll have available next year. Um, so I'll have the regular Urtica dioica, um, and then I've got one um, called fen nettle um, that is a little bit less stingy. So it still is covered in in hairs, but most of them aren't stinging. Um, and it, that one has like much, much larger leaves and stems. So the leaves are at least twice as big as the regular um, species Urtica dioica, um, which makes them easier to use um, a little bit later into the season as the, uh, the stems get too tough and fibrous to eat. You need to start tearing off the leaves off the stem to use it as a fresh vegetable. And if those leaves are huge, it just it makes it easier. Um, so it can be nice to have multiple varieties of, of different kinds of nettle. That's cool. What, well, I wonder what kind of, I probably just got the normal nettle from you, right? I, yeah, I think so. Um, but I'll definitely hook you up with this uh, fen nettle because um, I think it, it's Plus also... it sounds like fentanyl and like you know, <laughs> people. It's much less dangerous. <laughs> um, but I think it would grow great at your place because uh, they like wet spots. Like a, a fen is like a, a swamp area. Um, so you've got plenty of swamp I've areas. I've got plenty of swamp area. Yep. My tick farm. <laughs> <laughs> my, my tick and leech farm. Oh, shit. Um yeah, and if, if you want to check out like a picture on the internet of a really wild nettle, um, I think it's called Urtica ferox. It's a, a type of tropical nettle that has just some really extravagant stings on it. It's it's oh, worth cool. it's worth a peek. Cool. Yeah, it's my um, it's my one of the kids from my kids' nursery school. Anyway, whatever. He he just moved up the street from us, and. Uh, his mom was telling us there's tons of nettles on this path right across from our house. And I was like, I've always looked at that path. I've never gone down there. Like, and it's just crazy how, um, like this knowledge of like, you know, using nettles is like, if you're like in the city and you're around, like, it's just not common, but then like you meet people who, you know, have like, like, I feel like in Maine, um, there's, there's like a, I don't know, like a deeper, there's a, there's a deeper ecological practice here or, or maybe not ecological, but like people, there's a lot more people here who've like learned how to like wild harvest plants from their grandparents than there are in a lot of other places. Yeah, I find. And, or maybe I'm just coming across way more people who just like, who I'm just like shocked at how much they know about yeah, like plants and shit. It's, uh, it's interesting. I don't know. I haven't, I've never really lived outside of Maine. So I don't, I don't have good comparison. And when you're like passing through a place or traveling, you, you don't get really the same sense of, of the place and of the people as you do like really living there. Right. Or you can just like project just what you want to think about anywhere you go. Oh uh, yeah. Or you, you like <laughs> the, the people that you're going to find while traveling are not like really representative. Totally. Um, well, I, I don't know if there's, um, anything else about nettle? I feel like we've, that's, that's most of the anecdotal stuff I've, I've learned about nettle. Yeah. Um, I yeah. Like, I think, uh, I think we did, uh, did that plant a decent amount of justice and, uh, yeah. Did we get any questions about Turkish rocket? Um, I had, uh, a comrade in Indiana, um, who was, 
um, talking about the um, Turkish rocket that he had, and he was wondering if we just had like a late, um, like a late blooming Turkish rocket because the Turkish rocket that they got from um, Restoration Seeds is the company. That's where I used to buy mine. Mine never grew when I got from them, but um, he was saying that his are not like f- fuzzy leaves oh, interesting. and that um, his are, uh, or they looked like they weren't fuzzy. I should say he didn't say that. I'm sorry. I shouldn't say that. He said that they were just like, they looked very different than the ones you have. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I don't know. I'd be very interested to try growing maybe he wants out. To, maybe he wants to trade or something. Yeah. You know? It'd be cool to swap, uh, swap some seeds and see, um, if they are substantially different when grown in the same conditions. Um, but it's a it's a species that has a pretty broad um, native range and is naturalized very widely. So it, it wouldn't be surprising if there were some you know genetic variants from place to place or population to population. Yeah, what he was asking me is, have you tried the um, Italian Turkish rocket because that's supposed to be the cold hardest? That was like the quest. That was his question. Yeah. I don't actually know the origins. Um, my, most of my Turkish rocket uh, came from my friend Lisa Fernandez's garden. I don't know where she got it. Um, and then I have another patch in another area of the garden um, that I'd swapped seeds with someone and just to get um, a little bit extra, um, sort of broaden the gene pool a little bit, make sure it wasn't getting too inbred. Um and they both seem very similar. Uh, the stuff from Lisa is maybe a little bit larger, mm-hmm. um, but that might just be soil conditions. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. But it, it definitely seems totally um, winter hardy here. Um, definitely taken negative 22 Fahrenheit right. with, with no problems. So um, I don't anticipate any issues. Yeah, and, and the, the but the other thing this person was saying is that... Um, like, you know, because, I don't know, when you see the word rocket in Europe, it's mm. arugula. Yeah, for sure. And so, like... It's a terrible th- common name. Yeah, this person was really uh, associating it with arugula. Yeah. And, um, like, talking about arugula, and I was like, no, it's not It's not an arugula. But, like... It's not it's arugula in the same from family, Turkey. But it's this, yeah. It's yeah. Like, that... Um, that's one of the things about common names that just kind of irk me, is... Um, <laughs> I think I think we can do better with common names, and it's entirely possible to change common names, um, especially for unusual plants, um, just by starting to use a different name. Right. Uh, so Turkish rocket, not a great common name because it makes everyone think of arugula, um, and Turkish rocket is not that similar to arugula. It's mu- much more like a mustard green. Um, another one is Jerusalem artichoke. Right. Um, which has nothing to do with Jerusalem or artichokes. Um, and it's just a bad common name. Um, I, my favorite common name for Jerusalem artichoke is Terrasol, uh, which is what my friend Will Bonzel calls them. Um, so I'm trying to... Uh, Terrasols. When, whenever I talk about that plant, try and mention that I call them Terrasols now. I call them fartichokes. Mm, that's, a, that's a pretty good name. <laughs> Um, so other comments I got, accurate. I actually got some great feedback on, on this project. Um, I got, uh, another, one of the other people who reached out was from the Bayou food forest. Uh, that's a food forest that was planted directly in the path of the Bayou pipeline in down there. And so they're down there like growing bananas and like, you know, sharing banana trees and nice. Yeah. Doing... I heard from them as well. It sounds like a cool oh, they project. Hit you up? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah, I, I sent them some seeds and stuff. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Well, he, he hit me up about Moringa. He was like, y'all should do Moringa and sweet potatoes. Yeah. Um, I don't know that much about either of those. I could definitely talk for a while about uh, sweet potatoes, but I think that would probably be a good one to bring bring in some guests or a guest on. Yeah, he really wanted to come on and talk about. Uh, sweet. Let's talk to they, they wanted to come on and talk about. But Moringa, too, I was like, I had never even heard of that plant. Yeah, Moringa's pretty neat. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, if you're in a tropical climate, it's definitely one to check out and probably grow um the whole plant it's a tree it's edible edible leaves edible seed pods edible roots really flavorful really nutritious um yeah i uh an old friend of mine 
married an Indian woman. She's like, can you grow Moringa around here? I really want Moringa. And I was like, oh, yeah, people are stoked on Moringa. It's hard to grow around here. Um, another friend did grow a bunch in a, uh, a greenhouse, um, and they grew amazingly, like, you know, over six feet tall in a single wow. year. Um, and then they died down. And then they died, like just outright died. But yeah, growing it as an, I'm, yeah, I'm kind of yeah. interested to grow it as an annual. I'm just Certainly a, worth some experimentation. Yeah, it got me pumped reading this. Reading what this person showed me about uh, moringa, I was just like, whoa, that's fucking awesome. And then, um, yeah, the other, the the other, the number one plant that people wanted to hear more about was elderberries. Actually, yeah. So we'll we'll. We'll, we'll do we an do episode on elderberry soon. Yeah. Maybe the next one. Yeah. And if you have questions about stinging nettle or anecdotes or, you know, suggestions or comments or whatever. Yeah. Definitely email us or if possible, record a voice memo on your smartphone and email that to us so that we can just plug that right in rather than us reading your email. And that would be so much cooler. And you can send it to S-O-L-E at S-O-L-E-O-N-E dot org. And what's your email? Uh, edgewoodlandscapes at gmail.com Join us for Kite Line, a weekly radio program on Channel Zero Network that focuses on issues in the prison system. With over 50 episodes already released, you can hear informative and riveting stories about the impact of prisons on people both inside and outside of the prison walls and how they fight back. Kite Line is intended as means of communication between people across prison walls. Our goal at Kite Line is to amplify the voices of those within the prison system while encouraging dialogue with those on the outside. Hear us on the Channel Zero network and visit our website for more information or previous episodes at kitelineradio.noblogs.org.